Hi, welcome to Author Spotlight. My name is Lucy and this is the program on AADL TV where each episode I take a little bit of time to tell you about one author and some of the works of that one author. The writer that I will be shining a spotlight on today is Percival Everett. Percival Everett has really become well known recently for a few reasons. One is that his novel Erasure, written in 2001, was the basis for the film American Fiction, which came out in 2023. And though Everett had nothing to do with the film. There was a lot of attention on him as a writer and his book Erasure at that time. And most recently, in 2024, Everett has published a book called James, which has been met with much acclaim and success, rightfully so. It is already on some award long lists and will probably be included on more. It is being called a retelling of Huck Finn from the enslaved Jim's point of view, but that's simplifying what the book is about, and I will talk more about that book in a bit. Before he wrote James, ever wrote a book called The Trees that was published in 2021, and this was shortlisted for the Booker Prize. However, before any of these books, Percival Everett had a long, long backlist. He's written over 30 books. James was his 24th novel. He is the author of four short story collections, six poetry collections, one children's book. He also is a painter and has had several art shows. Percival Everett is a great innovator of fictional form. It would be hard to say what genre does Percival Everett write or what kind of books does he write? Because though his books may borrow from genre fiction, they are certainly always challenging genre fiction as well. I've listened to a number of interviews with Percival Everett and he is just a really aware, intellectual, a linguist, a philosopher. He is a meticulous researcher and he is a very precise, and careful writer and all of these skills allow him to write really successful satire and a wide variety of novels across genre. The first book that I read by Percival Everett was The Trees. This book is a book about lynching. It is written in the form of a police procedural and it is extremely funny at the same time that it's horrifying. So you're reading this book and as you're reading it, you're laughing out loud at things you really feel uncomfortable laughing about. And in one of the interviews I listened to with Everett, he said that he aims to use humor as a way to disarm his readers. And once he's disarmed them with humor, then he can address serious stuff. And The Trees is really telling part of the story of our nation's history with lynching, but also its continued failure to address that. So it takes place in a small rural Mississippi town and there is a string of gruesome murders in this town. So investigators begin to look into the murders. They discover that there has been a pattern of similar cases, similar gruesome murders that are all connected to one particular piece of this town's past. A pair of detectives from the Mississippi Bureau of Investigations arrive on the scene to try and solve this puzzle. They themselves add a lot of humor to the book. Their banter and their dialogue is very funny and very witty, and they are both black men and expect to receive a lot of resistance from the sheriff, the local sheriff in this town, from his deputy, from white townsfolk who are typically racist. Part of the puzzle of the murders that is so difficult to solve is that at the scene of each crime, there is a second dead body in addition to the victim. This second dead body resembles Emmett Till. That clue leads the police to suspect that these murders are an act of retribution and begin to realize that equally horrifying murders are happening in much the same way all across the country. These bodies pile up and the detectives learn more and more. And we learn more and more about who is getting killed and why they are getting killed. This doesn't sound 
like it should be funny. This sounds like a horror novel and a really brutal yet necessary recounting of this chapter in American history. And it is, it's a chilling mystery when you read this, and it's impossible to put down for a couple of reasons. There are these short chapters that are really urgent in their feel, and they're so compelling that you want to read more. It's also just very funny, surprisingly so. And this is one of those cases where Everett is using real humor to expose the mechanisms of racism but also to disarm the reader. This combination of comedy, of mystery, of horror, and this serious examination of racism make this book extremely complex and really hard to slide into any one genre and left me wanting to read more Percival Everett. The next book that I read of Percival Everett's was James. There is a lot of talk right now about James and you can read a lot about James and you can hear a lot about James, as I said, for good reason. So. This is the story of the enslaved character Jim from Mark Twain's Huckleberry Finn, but it's really oversimplifying things to call it a retelling or even a reimagining. I would say that this is really a book that's in conversation with Huckleberry Finn, and it is the full fleshing out and the full realization of a character who is in Huckleberry Finn and who is central to Mark Twain's book, but who we don't get a full picture of. In some of the interviews I listened to with Percival Everett, he said that he read Huckleberry Finn 15 times in a row, just would finish it and then turn right back to the first page. And once he had read it 15 times, it was really ingrained in him. He didn't have to rely on Twain's story to write his story of James because it was just really part of his way of thinking. Huckleberry Finn by Mark Twain is obviously written from the point of view of Huck Finn, who is a small boy. So we're getting this boy's point of view. And there are parts of the book where Jim and Huck are not together. So there's a whole world to create there alone on the page about what Jim is doing during those times. But then also there is the interior life of James and there's James as a person and James with a family. And that is really where Everett's book goes. And from the first page, we realize that there is much more to James than meets the eye, just alone by the way he speaks and the way he thinks. And language in this book is very important. It's a running joke, but it is also so dangerous and powerful. James and his family treat the way that they speak to white people as a foreign language. And it is something that James has to teach his children to do, to repeatedly remind them to do this. Because if white people found out how James and his family and other enslaved people actually spoke and thought, they would be terrified of them. And I think the easiest way to tell you about this is to just give you an example. So this is from the point of view of James. That evening, I sat down with Lizzie and six other children in our cabin and gave a language lesson. These were indispensable. Safe movement through the world depended on mastery of language, fluency, the young ones sat on the packed dirt floor and I was on one of our two homemade stools. The hole in the roof pulled the smoke from the fire that burned in the middle of the shack. Papa, why do we have to learn this? White folks expect us to sound a certain way and it can only help if we don't disappoint them, I said. The only ones who suffer when they are made to feel inferior is us. Perhaps I should say when they don't feel superior. So let's pause to review some of the basics. Don't make eye contact, a boy said. Right, Virgil. Don't speak first, a girl said. That's correct, February, I said. Lizzie looked at the other children and then back to me. Never address any subject directly when talking to another slave, she said. What do we call that, I asked. Together they said, signifying. Excellent. They were happy with themselves and I let the feeling linger. Then he goes on to have them try some situational translations. And that is where you really see this slipping into a slave dialect from the way that James really speaks and thinks and James's family really speaks and thinks. Language leads into story and story is another really strong theme in this book. This book is really about a man fighting for the right to tell his own story, both literally and figuratively, and to tell the story of his family and to have the agency to be able to tell this story. James does get a hold of a pencil and he gets a hold of something to write on 
and that allows him to begin to put his life down on the page. James says, with my pencil, I wrote myself into being, I wrote myself to here. Another black man is lynched for stealing a tiny pencil nub from a white man that he gives to James so that James can tell his own story and therefore maybe the story of other enslaved people. What James is writing in is a book of minstrel songs because for a while he's part of this minstrel group. And that is shown by example for us in the book because there are these actual minstrel songs written out in the front of the book. It would be easy to spend hours talking about James. I do wanna talk about some of Everett's other work. Erasure, the novel that gave the idea of American fiction, was published in 2001. This was Everett's 12th novel. It is about a writer, Thelonious Monk Ellison, who writes literary critical books that are very well crafted, but not very well sold or received. And he's been told by his agent that his books just aren't black enough to sell. So he sees this Oberlin educated black woman meet huge success when she writes this book called We Lives in De Ghetto. And this book is everywhere. It's an it book. It's the book on everyone's nightstand that everyone's talking about. And Monk can see how false it is. He sees who it is who really writes this book. And so he decides that he will succumb to the temptation to just give the publishers and the agents this black book. And he writes a book called My Pathology. And he writes it under a pseudonym of Stag R. Lee. And Stag R. Lee is the main character. So Monk assumes this role of Stag R. Lee, which is vastly different from who he really is. When his agent submits this book, every publisher wants a piece of it. And soon Monk is getting offered the six-figure advance from major houses. And there's a multi-million dollar fight for the movie rights. And all of a sudden, it, his book, My Pathology, is it. Along the way, he does change the name of his book to be more incendiary, and still people want to get their hands on it. The money from this book allows Monk to take care of his mother to help her get where she needs to be. She is aging, she has Alzheimer's. But with the notoriety that this book also gains him comes this other dark side. Monk is going to have to somehow give himself away or continue to pretend to be staggerly in certain situations. And there are ways he can do this. He can be a reclusive author. It gets more complicated when Monk is asked to be a judge for a big time literary award. And then his book gets nominated. And he has to then face the reality of what he's done. And this, if you've seen the movie, you know this plot as well. There are some big differences between the book and the movie, and I think it probably depends on which you encountered first that informs if you prefer one or the other. I read the book before I saw the movie. This book is such a good satire. Again, it's got humor. Percival Everett just really doesn't shy away from skewering the idea of political correctness and satirizing the publishing industry and the publishing industry's complicity in perpetuating these stereotypes of Black America through the authors that they're publishing. After reading The Trees and James and Erasure, I read Percival Everett's novel called Telephone. This was published in 2020, and it was nominated for the Pulitzer Prize in Literature. This book is about a man named Zach Wells, who is a geologist and a paleobiologist, but in a very specific way. His field of expertise is very narrow. Essentially, it's about the history of a cave that is above the Colorado River in the Grand Canyon. He is a man of few words. He seems to tend towards melancholy. And he says, some people are just no good at being happy. And by some people, I mean me. He does enjoy spending time with his wife and daughter. He plays chess with his daughter. They have a really wry and biting sense of humor that they both share. And his wife and daughter are really the most important thing to him. He's a professor and he would rather not participate in committee meetings. He goes on a field trip and there's a professor, another professor on that trip who wants to gain tenure. And there's a complicated story around that. There's a student who's trying to hit on him. And those are really the only things he gains from this field trip. So he comes home from this again, dissatisfied. 
And two things happen to Zach Wells. The first is that while he's playing chess with his daughter, he starts to notice that she's slipping up, which is something she would never do. She's better at chess than he is. And she starts to space out and they find out that she's having seizures. It turns out that his daughter has something called Batten disease, which is a fatal degenerative disorder. And her vision starts going and her mind will eventually start going. And it's just tragic because it's inevitable what will happen to her. And so all of a sudden, Zach Wells and his wife become this couple that is trying to grieve while also spend time with their daughter and trying to come to terms with this. Zach likes to order his clothes online. One of the jackets he orders has a note in the pocket which says, Ayudame, help me in Spanish. And he doesn't know if it's a cry for help or if it's a joke. He orders something else from the same seller and he gets another note. And he can't save his daughter and he couldn't help someone in his department get tenure and he wants to save someone. And so he takes these notes literally and he starts to follow the path of where these notes are coming from. And he leaves his house and family for longer and longer periods of time. He takes this long wander in the desert to try and solve this mystery of the notes. It's this secret mission to New Mexico. And he discovers that there's a group of women who have been trafficked and who are being held and enslaved and made to make these clothes. And he decides that he is going to save them. They begin that journey of escape. And here's another way that Telephone gets really interesting. Percival Everett wrote this book with three different endings. So when you read it, when you buy it, you get it from the library, you don't know which one of the endings you're reading. And all three endings deal with Wells's journey through the desert with these women and ultimately what happens with them. Does he get them across the border? Does he help them? I know what happened in the version I read and I'm not sure how different. I think it's just a number of sentences that are different. But that also really gives meaning to the title Telephone. You know, the game Telephone, a message being passed on and changing slightly through each passing on and each retelling. So this book is really at its heart, this, this sort of gut-wrenching story about this couple, this middle-aged couple with a teenage daughter and the grief that they are encountering. But it's also a campus novel. It also gets into some politics as it deals with the border, sort of this borderland thriller. And there's a mystery and these elements all come together in a really, really interesting and compelling way that is intense and emotional and at times funny. This is Percival Everett and make you want to keep reading. None of his books are very long. This one is 217 pages and he manages to pack a lot into each book in no small part because of his writing and his language. This book seemed less satirical to me than the other books that I read. The final book that I am going to tell you about today, because I can't talk about 24 novels, is Watershed. And this was written in 1996. So one of his earlier books, and it is only 200 pages. It could be described as genre fiction in the way that Percival Everett writes genre fiction. It has elements of a mystery. As it unfolds, it becomes clear that mystery is not the only path that Everett is going to follow in this book. This book is about a man named Robert Hawks, who is a hydrologist. He lives in Colorado. This book takes place sort of uh, a landscape north of Denver, where he's gone to study water. And He's very curious and he gets himself into a place where there is a river being diverted and it changes water that is going to the lands of native people and water that is getting sent to the town. And he starts to sort of figure out that there's something wrong going on here. At the same time, he encounters this woman named Louise, who's from the tribe whose land he is near or on. She seems to be up to something right in the beginning, but he's not sure what. And he encounters her again and again, and he sort of starts to meet her family. And he starts to learn about other things that have been happening to them. He doesn't even know if he likes Louise as a person, but he is compelled to keep showing up for her and keep helping her out. And he finds himself in continued encounters with her. At the same time, he's in this remote place in part because he's trying to escape from this 
girlfriend who he doesn't want to be in a relationship any with anymore, but she's very relentless and she's very needy. And she sort of refuses to hear that their relationship is over and gets troubled by the thought of that. And then there's a third woman in Robert Hawks's life who is an FBI agent who is there to investigate two other FBI agents who were killed in this vicinity. So obviously the FBI knows something as well. And they even suspect local tribes, people of these murders, but with Hawks's help, they soon realize that something different is going on. There are also chapters in this book where Robert remembers back to times with his parents and his grandparents. His grandfather was a very important person in the movement for civil rights. And here, uh, Everett sort of pulls together this shared history between Native Americans and Black Panthers and their civil rights fight in the 1960s. So there's a lot of pieces of history going on in this book. There is a note at the end that explains to you that the Native American tribe that Everett speaks of is made up the Plata Nation and the Plata Reservation. This is not a real nation nor a real reservation. However, there are pages from treaties between the United States government and various Indian nations throughout the book that are real and their public knowledge. And so these are also revealing this other slice of history. This is a good example of the kind of careful research that Percival Everett does for his novels, where he learns something completely. Like the knowledge that he has about hydrology in this book alone is pretty amazing. The narrator in Watershed and the narrator in telephone and even in erasure sort of all reminded me of each other in the way that they're sort of these gruff men, a little bit depressed. They're good at what they do. What they do is pretty specific, but they're not that good at necessarily relating to people and, and life. Percival Everett is a difficult author to talk about because there's no one way to talk about him, except to say that he is a really, really meticulous, careful, funny, smart, writer and you will get something different from him no matter which one of his books you pick up. I would recommend any of these books that I talked about. I know that there are countless others that are also very popular. And then there's a big backlist for you to look through of titles that you may not have heard of at all. So I recommend that in some way you read some of the words of Percival Everett. Thank you for joining me.